G'day everyone, uh, welcome to video 3.1.9 for the Legal Studies Guy. I've got an unknown quote today, um, but hopefully still a good one. Uh, if you want something you've never had, then you've got to, I should say, do something you've never done. Um, this is that idea of, yeah, take some risks. Um, you know, if you really, really do want this, you, you want to succeed in year 12 and obviously... That's something you've never done. Um, but, you know, potentially you want to do better than you've done at school previously. It's not just going to happen. You've got to actually go out and do the work for it um, is what they're saying here. So change something up, change your routines, change your systems, um, and you're going to get out what you put in. So just a really important point as you work through year 12. Uh, what question are we going to be able to answer today? Today we're talking about key personnel in a criminal case. So that should say case, sorry. Uh, so the roles of key personnel in a criminal case, um, not trial, and I'll talk about the difference between those things in a moment. We're talking about the roles of them, we're going to talk about the judge or magistrate, so the person who runs um, the case or, or manages the case, uh, the jury and the parties. And our key skill we're going to talk about is analysing, which is a bit of a controversial skill in legal studies. So we will spend a little bit of time on that section. Essentially, um, what are we hoping you can do at the end of this? Well, yeah, someone says to you, oh, like I had this case the other day or I heard about this case the other day. Someone had the magistrate court and there was no jury. What's the go with that? You'll be able to explain why that is, what role the jury would be playing if they were there or how the role of the magistrate, say, differs from the role of a judge in a um, more serious um, indictable offence. So to make this really, really clear, um, as I made that error in that first slide but fixed up quickly, the key term here is key personnel in a criminal case. In the old study design, it said criminal trial, and we had to learn about trial responsibility. So what were these key people doing specifically within the trial? Now that it's criminal case, we're taking a broader view of the key personnel um, right through from when someone's charged all the way through to sentencing with obviously the trial or the hearing, just a small part of that. So we're looking at the entirety of the criminal case um, and effectively um, what we'll talk about when we get to analysing is we're starting to consider how these different people involved interact with each other, move around each other, um, in some cases support each other, um, et cetera, et cetera. So roles we need to be familiar with are the judge or the magistrate. So again, because they're listed in the study design, um, so just popping back here, judge or magistrate, jury and parties, because they are listed, that allows the um, examiners to ask us directly about them. So you're not just going to get a question that's like, hey, explain um, the role of one key person in a criminal case. You can get asked, hey, explain the role of the parties. Um, explain the role of the jury, explain the role of the magistrate. So you need to know each of them. You can't just pick a couple that you're like, oh, I'll just learn about the judge. So we're going to start with indictable offences. I'm going to split them up into indictable and summary offences um, just so we can understand, I guess, how it might change a little bit from the county and the Supreme Court back down to the magistrate's court. But essentially the um, fundamental role of each of these key personnel is the same regardless of the level of the crime alleged. Um, look, judge centrally, and for, for each um, personnel, I'll have this kind of, I guess, central role that you can um, definitely name as a sort of catch-all um, say, identify, say you're asked to explain one role of the judge, you could just do this catch-all, hey, one role of the judge is to be the impartial third party. So that's going to be heavily linked to fairness, which we'll talk about for the principles of justice. So the judge is the impartial third party. They're the umpire. They're the adjudicator. Um, they don't make the decision. They don't deliver a verdict in indictable offences. That's the jury, which we'll get to in a moment. But the judge kind of manages everything else. So they make decisions on rules of evidence and procedure. You know, they imply and enforce those rules equally. So particularly when we get into a trial, that means running, who gets to speak when, what order things occur in. Um, but also through the pretrial process, 
enforcing things like what evidence is allowed to be used at the trial, is evidence admissible or not, and they'll hear arguments from both parties often in regards to that, whether that evidence can be used. Um, you know, for example, my class last year, we were lucky enough to uh, go to the Supreme Court and, and witness, or well, not witness, but um, sit in the Supreme Court and, and watch some preliminary arguments. So before a terrorism trial had started, um, and it was the lawyers arguing over a piece of evidence. So the interesting thing with um, terrorism charges is, in this case, um, the accused persons had not committed a terrorist act, um, but there was an, they were charged with planning to or attempting to. So it's all about what's going on in their head, what their intention is with what they are doing. And how you prove that means, you know, you're going to have to come up with evidence that kind of hopefully to you um, or to a jury implies or tells a story of this person was thinking this. And that means some of the evidence can be really um, uh, perhaps a little bit tenuous or, you know, you might think it shows that, but uh, a defence team might think that it would actually just make a jury more prejudiced um, against the people involved. It doesn't tell the story that you want. You've got to meet certain rules around when evidence needs to be tendered, um, how much notice you need to give the defence that you're introducing new evidence. So we actually watched um, lawyers argue for about an hour. Um, one of my kids fell asleep. It was quite boring. Um, for about an hour about this one piece of evidence. Hey, when we run this trial next week, can we use this as a prosecution? And the defence was arguing that they couldn't because they hadn't met the rules of evidence properly. So they hadn't tendered the evidence early enough. They hadn't disclosed it to the other party. And as a result, they shouldn't be allowed to use it in trial or it would be unfair. Ultimately, judge makes that decision. So the judge gets to decide on whether that evidence can be used or not. So it's a really important role. Um, case management is up here. So um, case management during the pre-trial process, um, generally speaking, once someone is committed to stand trial in a superior court, like the county or the Supreme Court, um, it will be immediately then allocated to a judge and the judge will then get the parties in for directions hearings and the judge will get an update from, you know, more or less conference with the parties, find out where they're up to, start discussing things like, you know, what evidence they're planning to use at trial, therefore getting a list of potential witnesses, starting to try and understand how long the case will take to run, therefore how long they'll need to get a jury in for. That's all the stuff that the judge is also managing, so that case management side of things, which also speaks into that rules of evidence and procedure. Um, decides questions of law. That's what I've already spoken about then. You know, enforcing rules of evidence is often deciding um, whether something meets the requirements of a law. Um, deciding questions of law also could be dis um, explaining the meaning of a word in a piece of legislation. You know, if that word hasn't been um, defined before or interpreted, the judge might have to decide what that word means after hearing submissions from both parties. So the judge has that again, a really integral role of effectively being in charge of the law and making sure that the parties play within the boundaries of the law and then ensuring that they give the directions to the jury to therefore make a decision based on the law. So the judge is kind of that guardian role. And then ultimately, if an offender is found guilty, the judge will sentence them. So in terms of like if you're asked a question on the role of the judge or one role or two roles of the judge, you're going to be looking to say things like, hey, the judge will enforce rules of evidence and procedure equally. What does that mean? Will they decide whether evidence is admissible or not? They'll run the trial in terms of who gets to speak when. Or say it's case management. One role is case management, and then you'll delve into that. What does case management mean? Will timetabling witnesses... I mean, panelling a jury, um, giving directions to the parties, you know, holding directions hearings um, with the parties, uh, directing the jury, explaining the law to them, explaining the elements that need to be proved, um, telling them to disregard evidence or things that they've heard perhaps. So these are each distinct roles for the judge. So five of them there, which is quite a lot. And you've got that catch-all role of impartial third party. The jury is a little bit simpler. The jury is only there for the trial. The jury is 12 randomly selected members of the community. 
and their essential, again, catch-all role is deliver a verdict. How would you then explain what that means? Well, you can actually flesh out what deliver a verdict means through some of these below points. They need to follow instructions from the judge. They need to go away after they have objectively listened to the evidence and assessed it and then deliberate until they reach a verdict. Um, think about, you know, instructions from the judge. For example, we talked about with the right to silence as a, um, a right an accused person has. Maybe the accused person doesn't give evidence and the defence team asks the judge to give directions to the jury about that. And that could, or that would mean, if the defence requests it, the judge would explain to the jury that, hey, the accused person hasn't given evidence, hasn't, didn't give evidence, didn't get on the stand and answer questions. You are not allowed to make any inference from that. You are not allowed to say, oh, that's a bit, that's suspicious, maybe they're guilty. In your deliberation, you can only deliberate based on the evidence put in front of you. Assess what you heard from witnesses, assess their reliability, assess the, you know, any physical evidence that you saw, deliberate based on that, and then deliver a verdict. So catch all role, deliver a verdict, but you might go into more detail around listening to evidence, listening to witnesses, deciding on their reliability, the instructions that they get from a judge. Then we have the two parties, and I've split the two parties into um, a slide for each, the prosecution versus the defence accused, because when we talk about analysing the role of the parties, this is you know where you'd get into a really strong analysis, is the fact that the parties do operate quite differently. So ultimately, the catch-all role for the prosecution is to present evidence and arguments to the court and to the jury for an indictable offence to support a conviction. So the prosecution's working on behalf of the state, so they're working on behalf of all of us, you know, citizens in that state, to try and prove that an offender or an alleged offender has done the wrong thing so that they can give them a consequence, the court can give them a consequence to therefore promote social cohesion and keep society safe, you know, enforce those societal guidelines that are laws. Um, so how that works is... The Office of Generally for Indictable Offences, pretty much um, exclusively how it works, is the Office of Public Prosecutions, so lawyers employed by the government, will manage a case utilising evidence prepared by the police. So often the police will do, or the police will do the investigation. The police will often be the ones that lay the charges. They might check with the Office of Public Prosecutions first. And then once they're done that, the police will get their big fight often like physical files and folders of evidence and they will give it to the Office of Public Prosecution and say it's now yours to deal with. And what the Office of Public Prosecutions will do is they'll then manage the case and when it comes to presenting the case in court at trial, solicitors from the Office of Public Prosecutions will brief um, barristers. They're not always Crown prosecutors. They could be private criminal um, prosecutors who sometimes prosecute things on behalf of um, uh, the Office of Public Prosecutions. Um, sometimes it's just solicitors from the Office of Public Prosecutions in less serious matters. But effectively, um, this is how the different bodies or organisations work together. Police investigate, lay charges, pass that evidence on to the solicitors at the Office of Public Prosecutions who then run and manage the case. It's all about party control. Uh, and they will then brief a barrister, often a Crown prosecutor, who will then come into court and try and argue, um, present the evidence, um, and present arguments based on that evidence to the jury. The whole idea there is to prove beyond reasonable doubt that the accused person committed the crime. So if we're talking about roles, the role of the prosecution is to prove the accused person committed the crime beyond reasonable doubt. How do they do that? They deliver uh, evidence to the court. They question witnesses. They cross-examine any witnesses that the defence might bring. Um, and they develop arguments based off that that they deliver to the jury in maybe an opening address and then a closing address. We are also obviously talking about broader than just the trial. So if we talk about the criminal case as a whole, um, things like plea negotiations can also come up as roles of the prosecution. So offering incentives to, like we looked at in um, 
317, offering incentives to the accused person to plead guilty. Um, obviously, they'll also attend things like um, directions hearings or case conferencing that the judge will run. But essentially, trying to gain a conviction beyond reasonable doubt by presenting evidence and arguments to the jury. So where does the defence come in? The defence is obviously opposing a conviction, and this really swings all the way back to uh, the rights of an accused person and the right to silence. So really important that we understand, and there's again a bit of analysis here, that an accused person does not need to defend themselves. The prosecution must prove that they committed the crime. So that means if they want, they have the right to silence, but what they're likely to do is test the evidence of the prosecution. That means cross-examine prosecution witnesses, cross-examine the victim who is likely to be a witness if it's a crime with a victim, um, you know, provide uh, rationales, arguments based on any physical evidence um, that could sow doubt. Ultimately. They're not trying to prove that the accused person didn't commit the crime. They're trying to provide doubt that they did. And if there is a doubt, the person must be acquitted because they need to be convicted beyond reasonable doubt. Um, this could mean that they might present a defence like self-defence or something similar, um, perhaps for you know, sometimes used for things like murder and manslaughter charges. If they do that, they then have to prove the facts of self-defense. So they have to prove that their response was reasonable um, in light of the situation that they were in. So the burden can swing a little bit if the defense are trying to prove something. Really key point, and I've saved this for the end, an accused person is unlikely to be doing that by themselves, right? We know that from talking about legal aid. So the accused person is likely going to have a legal representative to support them, a lawyer. And this is a really, really important point. They are responsible for sourcing their own. Even if they're getting legal aid, you're responsible for applying for it. It's not automatic. So we call this, and this will come up a little bit in, um, in or it'll come up much more in civil law, but it is this concept in our system of party control. The accused person or the defence has full control over their own defence. That means they have to arrange their own representatives. If they don't get representatives, they have to run their own case, come up with their own defences. There is no support for them. There is no support from the judge either outside of the judge explaining processes, procedures to ensure that there is fairness, but the judge can't help them present their case. The judge can't give them advice on the evidence they're using. The judge can't give them advice on the arguments they're putting forward. The parties are responsible for that themselves. If we swing to summary offences, we'll be able to do this a little bit or quite a bit quicker. Um, you know, these are pictures of judges, not magistrates, but, you know, same difference really. Um, magistrates effectively do the same thing as judges, except they also deliver a verdict because there is no jury for summary offences. Okay, not there. Really, really important that we understand that. So the magistrate kind of levels up in the sense that they'll also deliver a verdict. Um, some of the wording might change a little bit. So the magistrate will still do case management. There's likely to be less case management because there's less pretrial steps. Um, but, um, you know, things like a mention hearing, which is where you first hear a summary offence um, and you find out how the person's basically a mention hearing is the magistrate reading out the charge and the accused person saying either guilty or not guilty. And if they say not guilty, they have to go on to this contested mention hearing, which happens generally at a later date, it's adjourned. Um, and at that contest mention, that's when they might, again, figure out whether, you know, start going through some summaries of the case, figure out again if the person's going to agree to plead guilty or not guilty, um, and then start talking about things like what witnesses will be needed at a contested hearing, Therefore, how long is a contested hearing likely to go for? And that's where the judge might have to give directions to the parties, decide on the timetable of that. So that's that case management role again, sort of running the show and potentially decide questions of law. You know, saw a case recently, um, just a really, you know, straightforward driving charge, drug driving, um, 
and the prosecution attempted to put forward the guy pled guilty and the prosecution attempted to put forward evidence for his sentencing um, of a prior conviction. So if there was a prior conviction there, he could have his license suspended for longer. Um, and the defence argued that that evidence was inadmissible. It was inadmissible because um, it didn't meet the guidelines of Section 84 of the Road Safety Act or something like that. You know, they'll think there was an infringement notice that didn't have the value of the fine written on it. Um, and based on missing that detail, the infringement notice wasn't valid and the judge decided it didn't meet the requirements of Section 84. So the judge then... Um, decided it was inadmissible. So this person got sentenced as if they had never been done for drug driving before. So again, magistrate in charge of enforcing those rules of evidence and procedure, enforcing um, you know the steps once we get through a um, mention hearing, adjourning the matter to come back for a contest mention, deciding whether they might be able to proceed that day, timetabling things, that's all the magistrate. And then ultimately, if the person is found guilty, the magistrate will sentence them. So a little bit more holistic for the magistrate, but if you want to be- pair it back really simply, run the case as an impartial third party, deliver a verdict and sentence, as opposed to a judge who runs a case, impartial third party, directs a jury, sentences if found guilty, but doesn't give the jury, uh, doesn't give the verdict. No jury, as we discussed. And the role of the parties changes a little bit um, in the magistrate's court, just in the sense of the Office of Public Prosecutions won't be involved. So prosecutions in the magistrate's court are usually led by police prosecutors. So these are employees of Victoria Police. If you're in a town that has a magistrate's court, um, you should find that your magistrate's court is built next door to your police station. That's because if people are um, summonsed, so receive a summons for a summary offence to appear in the magistrate's court. Um, they'll just be given the date. They won't necessarily be given a direct time. So often you're on court days, you'll see magistrate's courts are very busy with a lot of people waiting. Um, they're built next to um, police stations so that the police prosecutor can work at the station and just come across to the courtroom when they need to. So it facilitates um, easy access for those police prosecutors. Um, then same deal outside of that. Fully responsible for their own case, police prosecutors must present it to the impartial third party. The magistrate isn't going to help them. The magistrate isn't going to deliver that, give them advice on the evidence they're using or the questions they're asking witnesses. Um, it is purely up to the police prosecutor to try and prove beyond reasonable doubt that an accused person committed a crime. Um, they may engage with the defence pre-trial, much like uh, indictable offences um, through these things called summary case conferences that are run. Um, summary case conferences are things that are uh, available to an accused person accused of a summary offence. So you can actually ring, um, there's numbers online, you can ring up and be like, hey, can I just talk about my case with you? And the prosecutor should um, basically call you back and talk to you about your case, just directly be like, hey, like, yeah, this is what we charge you with. This is the evidence we've got. The, like, this is the facts that we have in front of us. Um, the idea being that you have more of that information sharing, you're hopefully promoting um, a person pleading guilty because they're like, oh, yes, sweet, you, you know all of that. Well, I better plead guilty. Um, or at least um, minimising issues so hearings can happen quicker. But again, prosecution's central thing is this, attempting to prove, the essential role is attempting to prove that a person did something beyond reasonable doubt, so supporting a conviction. And the defence is the same um, as indictable offences. Test the evidence, might present their own evidence and arguments, but in reality, um, they have the right to silence. The prosecution needs to prove that they did um, the thing they're accused of, um, have to source their own legal representation, um, even if that means getting support from VLA or getting support from a duty lawyer. This is just a little important note about summary offences. Matters can be dealt with in your absence. So if you get summoned for a summary offence to a magistrate's court and you don't turn up, you can be found guilty not being there. That is an important distinction because that can't happen for an indictable offence. And obviously pre-trial processes as well. So really, really clear what is a role of the defence of the accused. Well, they're trying to oppose a conviction.
trying to potentially prove uh, or provide doubt, not prove that I didn't do something, provide doubt on the prosecution's evidence. Key skill. <clears throat> so the key word here is we are analysing the responsibilities of key personnel in a criminal case. And I actually think that's meant to say roles. Again, mixing up my wording, but analyze the roles of key personnel in a criminal case. So, analyze. What does the word analyze mean? Analyze has been on a bunch of exams in the past few years, and it's caused a bit of um, conjecture amongst teachers around what do the words analyze mean. Where we want to go to find this information is this magical, magical document called the examination report. So that's written by the chief examiner um, with input from people who assess and mark your exams. And you'll see here um, that the chief assessor in 2022, I believe it was, said some students did not analyze for these questions, including this one here, which was an analyzed question. And they tell us what an analysis is. An analysis is more than an explanation and requires students to examine facts, data, or issues in detail. So examine something in detail. Draw out implications. Words such as moreover, therefore, in contrast, and or this can be seen, can be used to demonstrate an analysis. Here's another section from an examination report. An analysis requires students to examine facts in detail. Students should consider whether their response examines an issue in detail or merely provides an explanation. So it's more than an explanation. Can't keep harping on this enough. And a lot of teachers will go out there and say, oh, analyze, just, you know, do strengths and weaknesses. And it's not that. That's really important. It is examining an issue in detail. So you should be looking for, again, to include words like moreover or therefore is a great one. For example, this can be seen in contrast. So perhaps talking about the parties, you know, the prosecution does this in contrast to the defense who doesn't need to perhaps present their own evidence. Um, the uh, judge does this, acts as the impartial third. Da, da, da. Therefore, this means that the parties have control over their own case. So starting to try and look at the roles in terms of how they interplay together, how they interact with each other, but then also the limitations that this maybe brings out in terms of particularly the principles of justice. So there was this question uh, a couple of years ago. This is a discuss question. So discuss the responsibilities of the parties in the case. Um, could be a um, could be something you get as part of an analysis as well, um, but just starting to think about again what do each of these key per, um, key people in a case do, but also what are maybe some of the issues with this or how do they maybe interact or um, what are the relationship between those parties? So you can read through that pretty um, pretty easily. I won't harp on every single dot point on it, but just starting to think about you know hey. Um, you know, the defence has control over their own defence, so you have to get your own lawyer um, to try and discredit the prosecution's evidence if you want to plead not guilty, etc. An issue with this is that it requires representation that's expensive. You might not be on the same footing as the prosecution who are trained legal representatives. That's starting to examine what the defence does as a party in a lot more detail. So it goes beyond an explanation. Because the judge can't help you because they're an impartial third party, it means that you need that representation because you need that representation that's potentially an issue. So starting to understand in a little more depth what implications come from, because again, really key word here, um, you know, therefore, so bringing out implications, what implications come from the limitations or... I guess, the um, restrictions on the roles, you know, what the judge can do, what juries can do, et cetera. You know, juries aren't legal experts. 
Uh, evaluation of the principles of justice. I've just covered a lot of that there. Um, so as usual, if you want to pause, do. Um, but jumping straight into it, you know, judge not being able to help unrepresented parties. Therefore, you need representation. It's expensive. That's not access because you can't engage in an informed way. The prosecution has more resources and are lawyers compared to you, an accused person who is not. That's a disparity or a disadvantage. Um, the judge is impartial. Impartiality is fairness. Um, all these things, you know, the fact that parties have control and will use legal representation actually promotes access because it means they're more informed. Um, so all of these things link really well to these principles of justice and can be used um, very much so as part of that analysis of those roles as well. Um, case here I'll link down below, a um, bit of an older one, but... Um, yeah, it was a case where the judge got very, 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 very frustrated um, with the accused person uh, to the point where um, it could be argued that the judge lost um, maybe their impartiality. And that obviously opens up appeal avenues and things like that for an accused person. So sort of highlighting the importance of the judge remaining impartial. Uh, look, rush through very much some of the skills there, but hopefully that gives you a bit more idea of what the word analyze means. And I would recommend really trying to wrap your head around that. Um, but hopefully, yeah, if someone came up to you and said, hey, talk me through a criminal case, like what's happening? What are the key people doing? Who's interacting with who? Hopefully you can start giving a bit more detail. You can start giving a bit more of an understanding of how the two parties interact with each other, where the judge becomes involved, what a jury does once they're impaneled for a trial. Um, and as a result, uh, nail any exam or SAT questions that you get on this topic. As always, feel free to leave feedback below, uh, but happy study.